Today, the United States is mourning the death of world-renowned runner Steve Prefontaine, whose life was tragically cut short in a single car accident late last night. He was just 24 years old, reaching the prime of his career. Prefontaine, or Pre, as he came to be known by many, was not only a remarkable cross-country and track athlete who competed for the University of Oregon, but was a symbol for change within both collegiate and AAU track and fields. His death will undoubtedly be felt around the world for quite some time after this awful mishap. Steve Prefontaine was born on January 25th, 1951 in the small coastal town of Coos Bay, Oregon. Coos Bay was very well known for its lumber production and its similarity to many small towns around the country at the time. This being said, high school football was a huge part of the community. So for every able boy in the 9th to 12th grade, there existed an unsaid sort of rule. You must go out for football. Of course, there was a cross-country running team, but it did not receive nearly as much hype or recognition as the football team did. Steve was just so unique through all of his childhood. He was always lighting up rooms wherever he went, and he always seemed to be the most outgoing child I've ever seen. Being from Coos Bay, football, well, I should say the sports in general, were important to staying out of trouble. Coos Bay sadly had a fair amount of drug activity happening during the time when Steve was a child. And 9 out of 10 times, if kids didn't occupy themselves with sports, they got involved with the drugs. So, Steve's father and I encouraged him to keep going out for sports, even though he didn't really need that much encouragement. And we were very delighted when he decided to try out for freshman football during his first year of high school. So Steve went out for football, but soon found that he was much too small and did not have the right physique to be a good football player. He decided to quit football early on in the season and to avoid getting into trouble, joined the Marshfield High School's cross country team. Steve had no real ambitions when joining this team. He was just doing the sport to participate in something. His freshman and sophomore seasons would reflect this attitude with their less than impressive results. Steve did not train very much, if at all, in order to make himself a better runner before his freshman and sophomore seasons. But before his junior year, Steve trained his mind and body and committed himself to being a new and improved runner. He saw results immediately in his cross-country season. He had major time improvements, as well as set a school record, went undefeated, and became state champion. When his junior track season came around, Steve was very ready to see more successes come his way from all of his hard work. He recorded personal bests of 901.3 for two miles, which was a state record, 414 for the mile, and 156.2 for the 800, and won the state meet two mile in 902.7. His senior year, Pre had the same junior year successes in cross country, and he also had a spectacular track season. Pre was undefeated in his senior year of track, winning state titles in the mile and two mile, and running high school personal records of 154.3 for the half mile and 406 for the mile, in addition to his national high school record two mile performance earlier that spring. All of the sudden successes really opened up college opportunities for Steve, and Division I coaches across the country began recruiting pre left and right. I must say that I absolutely despise regular recruiting. I believe it is a waste of time, and I hate to give away full scholarships to ungrateful young men. My coaching involves much more than just running. It's about teaching the boys to never expect handouts, and that anything worth having doesn't come easily. That being said, 
When I followed Steve's running throughout his junior and the beginning of his senior years in high school, I became aware that he was quite the standout athlete and that he would be a value on the Oregon track and field and cross country teams. I waited a while so as to avoid inflating Steve's already seemingly big ego, but eventually on October 30th, 1967, I wrote the young man a handwritten letter inviting him to come to Oregon and run. This was very uncharacteristic of me, but I felt as though I should be in charge of the recruiting of this one. I was pleased to hear back from Steve a short while later, confirming his commitment to come run with me and assistant coach Bill to run for the Oregon Ducks. So, it was official. Steve Prefontaine was now going to run in Eugene, Oregon for the next four years of his life, donning an Oregon Ducks jersey, representing the University of Oregon, every time he stepped foot on the track or the cross-country course for a race. Steve settled into the University of Oregon in the fall of 1969 with expectations already set very high for him because of his promising times from high school. Though college level running was a completely new style of competition for Pre, under the grueling but beneficial training of Bowerman and assistant coach Bellinger, he was able to become a much better athlete than he had already been in high school and Steve was able to compete incredibly well at the college level and beyond. With legendary Coach Bowerman training him, Steve became an elite college athlete that worked his way to the top of the collegiate running pecking order very quickly. Prefontaine was very successful all of his college years in both cross country and track and field. In the spring of 1970, Pre won an NCAA title in the three mile race on the track running a time of 13 minutes and 22 seconds. Prefontaine also managed to capture his first NCAA cross country championship in the fall of 1970. In his first outdoor track meet, Steve won the two mile race with a time of eight minutes and 40 seconds. And later on that season, he finished second in that same event, but set an Oregon freshman record and a new then personal best. For his successes in 1970, Steve earned a place on the cover of Sports Illustrated magazine at the young age of 19 years old. Much like 1970, the rest of Prefontaine's college years came with many successes due to hard work and striving to be the best runner in college. Steve went on to win three more three-mile NCAA track titles, running 13 minutes and 20 seconds in 1971, 14 minutes and one second for a five-kilometer race, which is 3.1 miles versus just three miles, in 1972. And in 1973, ran 12.53. In 1971 and 1973, Steve also earned the NCAA cross-country title. Pre became the first ever collegian to win four NCAA titles in the three-mile track race and second ever to win three NCAA cross-country titles. As for Oregon's conference, the Pac-8, now known as the Pac-12, Steve won three-mile track titles in 1970, 1971, 1972, and 1973, and also added a conference win in the one-mile race in 1971 
to his continuously growing, overall impressive resume. Overall, Pre raced 38 times on his home turf at Hayward Fields in Eugene from 1970 to 1975. These 38 races included not only his fast college races, but also his astounding Olympic time trial race, as well as his self-sanctioned races. With these 38 races, Steve was able to develop a winning streak of 21 races at one time in the second half of his college years. Losing only three times, with all three losses occurring at the one mile distance, his record was quite remarkable and it set him apart from many other track athletes during his time. His first loss came during his freshman year at the home twilight meet, in which he set an Oregon freshman record Pre's second loss came as a sophomore in the same twilight meet, but Steve narrowly lost to his own teammate, and it was a very good race. Prefontaine's final loss on home soil came on June 20th, 1973, when he was settling the pace for 1972 Olympic 800 meter gold medalist Dave Waddle, who was making an attempt at the American record at the time. Free led until 200 meters remaining in the race and finished second in a PR of 3 minutes 54 seconds. Waddle kicked to the win in what was the third fastest American mile and a personal record of 3 minutes and 53 seconds. Along with only having three total losses at home during his career, it is important to recognize the other awe-inspiring feats of Prefontaine's running career. Pre owned all eight of the American records for distances ranging from 2,000 to 10,000 meters and between two and six miles. Steve also held eight collegiate records while competing for the University of Oregon with his three mile time of 12 minutes 53 seconds and six mile time of 27 minutes 9 seconds still standing to this day. Overall, during his career, Pre broke his own or other American records 14 different times, broke the four minute mile barrier nine times, ran 25 two mile races under eight minutes and 40 seconds, and 10 5K races faster than 13 minutes and 30 seconds. Coach Bill Bowerman remembers what it was like to watch Steve run. Steve has and always will be one of the most talented and just overall amazing athletes that I have coached. And he just brought a special feeling whenever he came to the track. And especially home meets. He just left everything out there and left the crowd just with an amazing feeling and whenever you got to see Steve Prefontaine run it was just everyone got this intense excitement inside just because he was so into his races that it was just infectious and the whole entire stadium got into the race. In 1972, Pre ran in the Olympic trials on his home turf, Hayward Field. The 20th Olympiad was to be held in Munich, Germany during the summer of 1972. Steve was only a junior in college at the time, and he was relatively underestimated by some of the crowd who were unfamiliar with his incredible abilities. On Sunday, July 9th, the day of the race, 
Some of the sports reporters who were in attendance even thought that Steve Prefontaine was a teen who had wandered onto the warm-up field with the professionals. These people were in for quite a surprise, though. They did not know of the amazing talent and the race that they were about to witness. In the stands, many home team fans of Pre were cheering and anticipating the race to come. Some of these people even wore white t-shirts with a red stop sign on them, which read Stop Pre in big white letters. These shirts were a symbol of how confident people were in Pre's abilities and how adored he came to be. Prefontaine would compete in the 5,000 meter race that day, a race that he had become quite fond of and he had developed a great talent for. Twelve men towed the line for the start of the race, and the weather that day was warm, but not too hot, perfect for a great run. Pre took over the lead after the first half mile, and averaged around 66 seconds a lap through one and a half miles. Then, Pre ran laps of one minute and four seconds, in one minute and five seconds, stringing out the pack. Only one runner moved with him quickly, and was close to up to three laps to go. Pre continued to distance himself from the competitors throughout the remainder of the race, and he won the 5,000 meter run in a time of 13 minutes and 22 seconds. By winning this race, Steve earned his rights to be part of the 1972 Olympic track and field team, headed to compete in Munich, Germany that summer. Steve was the youngest member of the team, with his teammates being in their mid to late 20s, and Steve himself being just a 21-year-old junior in college. Needless to say, Prefontaine was also underestimated by his international competitors going into the games. So. Steve trained for the games with his fellow teammates, and soon, the time for the Olympics rolled around. When arriving in Munich, it was apparent Steve was nervous of what was to come, but he was also incredibly excited for the rush of racing world-class competition. Prefontaine relaxed before his time to run his preliminary 5,000 meter race came. This was the race that would qualify him for the finals and give him the chance to earn a medal. Pre finished this race in second place, running his way into the finals. During the days between Steve's prelim and finals race, a terrorist attack took place in the Olympic Village. Terrorists from Israel shot and killed several athletes, and the athletes who were not harmed but saw the whole event take place, like Steve, were greatly shaken. There was a mourning period for those who were killed, and many athletes were not able to get back into the full competitive spirit like they were before, but Steve managed to get his composure back together. On the day of the finals race, Steve was in his racing mindset and appeared to be ready as ever to run a great race. When the gun went off, Steve established himself as a serious competitor for a medal. He remained in the top four of the field of competition throughout the entire race, and he even led the race multiple times. With two laps remaining, about a half mile, Pre moved into third place and remained there until the last 100 meters of the race, where he got passed and barely missed meddling. Pre was instantly hard on himself and felt as though he were a failure for not receiving a medal. Even though he had realistically ran a spectacular race, it was not good enough for him. It was only when a reporter said to him, Don't be too hard on yourself, son. Think about how old you are, and how many more chances you have going for you in the future than these guys do. Then think about the rest of these guys. They have more experience, and there are no other college athletes out here competing. You are an outstanding runner, and you need to think about how good you'll be when you're the rest of these guys' age, when you're almost as good as them right now. These words really motivated Pre 
and got him through the disappointment of fourth place. He was instantly hungry for more improvement. Prefontaine's senior year at Oregon proved to be great for him. With the records he set and the number of winning track and cross-country meets he participated in, one fact that many people may not realize that outwardly, Steve seemed like he was doing just fine, but in reality, despite being one of the world's best athletes, he was living on food stamps and barely scraping by. Pete did not come from a rich family by any means, and he'd always been shorter on money than many of his college friends, but he did not like get this money aspect in his way. Steve was a fiery young adult and he was not afraid to stand up for what he thought was right. The attitude carried over into serious issues involving the AAU and the sport of track and field later, though. They spoke out against the group and stood up for themselves to try to make a case. The AAU was not providing for track athletes and they were being completely unfair. Steve and his teammates would walk into AAU meetings with open defiance and found out that other countries would give their athletes the appearance money for races, but American athletes did not receive their compensation, and the association kept all of the payments. Pre was always in trouble with the AAU officials, and he was an angry voice for the sport of track and field due to these meeting findings. Steve made it known that he was simply trying to make things more fair with the AAU and benefit all American athletes so they could get the same benefits as their European counterparts did. And he wanted to make the public aware of the AAU standings. He never wanted to create major turmoil for the AAU as well as the whole of collegiate track and field. In the midst of the AAU issues in 1972, Bill Bowerman and Phil Knight began working on athletic shoe designs and ended up founding the company now known as Nike. In 1973, the two men recruited their first athlete trial runner in Steve Prefontaine. When Pre joined Nike, the company was losing $50,000 per year and his only payment came in the form of new running shoes. Steve helped boost business for Nike by wearing their shoes, but he was still not receiving any financial help from the company. Steve was struggling more than ever for money, and in 1974, he was offered $200,000 per year by the professional track circuit in America, but he turned it down after the offer was put on the table because he wanted to go for more records and still have a chance at being a collegiate level athlete in the Olympics, rather than having to go pro status. Steve decided to not let money be a deciding factor in his near future with running. In the spring of 1975, Steve decided to defy the AAU yet again and host a series of meets with the Finnish national team in hopes to get revenge on Lasse Viren, the main competition from the previous Olympics. Viren was not able to make it to the U.S. for the May 30th at last minute, and Prefontaine was saddened, but got over it, and was still able to almost set another American record with the help of Frank Shorter, a record-setting American runner. That finished meet was a very successful meet for Mac Wilkins, who was a discus thrower. He beat the number one ranked thrower at the time in the world, and he was taking in some time to celebrate his victory, and he finally felt like he outshined Pre for once. With Steve always getting attention for winning, Mac thought that this would be his one chance in his time to shine. To celebrate and unwind, Steve and his teammates threw a party in the night of need. Everyone felt normal calm and peaceful that night. Eventually, everyone went their separate ways for the night, and they even talked about practice the next day, how Bowerman was sure to kill all of them with a monster workout. The next morning, Pree's family, teammates, community, and country all woke up to devastating news. 
Papers with front pages reading, University of Oregon, running prodigy, Steve Prefontaine, age 24, was killed in a single car rollover accident last night. It was unbelievable. Steve Prefontaine, with a whole career ahead of him, and a whole life ahead of him, lost all of his future in the blink of an eye. A freak fatal accident, on the way home from a celebratory party. No one knew how to react. The unthinkable was suddenly true. Meg Wilkins remembers that morning, grabbing a pair a paper in hopes to see his name sprawled across the front for beating the world champion. But he fell into shock when, ironically, Steve's headshot and that awful title occupied the front page. He always found a way to do it. I couldn't believe what I saw in the paper. Remembered Mac in an interview when fighting off tears. I was heartbroken over Steve's death, and I know everyone else was too. Steve's death took a hold on Oregon and the runners across America for quite a while, and he was given a very sentimental funeral on Hayward Field, where he almost felt at home. Steve's teammates talked of how great of a friend Pre came to be to them and how close they got over the years, despite differences. Today, Steve is still widely known as the best American track and field athlete of all time for his accomplishments. There's a trail in Pre's memory known as Pre's Trail, which is six miles of soft ground designed to how Steve Prefontaine would have liked it. His aggressiveness and tenacity would have been able to make him such a great difference in the future, most probably, and he would have been a great activist in the later years of his career. Ironically, in 1978, the Amateur Athletic Act became a law which broke up the AAU and guaranteed athletes' rights. In 1981, runners defied international amateur officials Track and field became professional in its ways. Steve Prefontaine's legacy lives on today, and he continues to inspire runners of all ages and abilities to have grit and perseverance to achieve their goals. If anyone tries to challenge Pre's viability as one of the greatest runners in American history, they should, took a, they should take a look at this list of numbers and the meaning of the numbers. Zero. The number of defeats in cross country or track during pre's junior and senior year in high school. 19. Pre's age when he appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated in 1970. 3. The number of NCAA cross country championships he won while at the University of Oregon. 4. The number of national titles earned in the three mile while in Oregon. Pre was the first track athlete to win four straight in the same event. Zero losses to races longer than a mile while running in Oregon. 35 and 3 was Steve's overall record at the mile at Oregon's Hayward Field. 40 years Pre's U.S. Olympic trials, 5,000 meter record stood until Galen Rupp broke it in less than two tenths of a second in 2012. 0.64 seconds separating Pre from bronze medalist Ian Stewart in the 5000 at 1972 Olympics. 7 is the number of US records set in distances between 2000 meters and 10,000 meters. 5000 which was the yearly value of the contract pre-signed with Nike in 1974 when he became one of the Shoemaker's first athlete endorsers. And finally, 78%, which is Pre's lifetime outdoor track win percentage across all distances, which was 119 wins in 151 races.